podcast going. Here's the, here's the big announcement. As you know, we are not meeting on the 4th of July. Surprise. And then Patty and I will be away on three Tuesdays for our um, big anniversary trip. We're heading to Norway where it'll be nice and cool. And um, love very much looking forward to that. Right, dear? Yes, and then we'll be back. Today we will finish 1 Samuel. I didn't, I didn't, can't say I planned it this way, but that's how it's worked out. We're going to finish 1 Samuel today. So when we come back um, after the break, whatever Sunday that is, after July, whatever Tuesday that is, after July 25th, we'll just pick up right at 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. That's the plan. August 1st, when we get, that'll be the next meeting, is August 1st after today. So, let's see. I think what I would like to do today is to go ahead and start to make sure we finish, but if we finish early, I will entertain any questions about anything. I just want to make sure that we actually do have time to, to get to the end of 1 Samuel rather than leaving just a little bit hanging over because it really is the split that was selected sometime in the past, I don't know when, um, is appropriate the way it works out. So the break between First and Second Samuel, because as you know, for the Hebrews, it was all one scroll. For the Jews, it's just one scroll. Jesus read the scroll of Samuel. Okay, so let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are, we are grateful to be here today. Um, Sure, it's hot, but it's Texas. Um, we pray for those who are not really set up for this kind of heat, for those who, who will struggle in it. Um, we're grateful for your presence with us today, and we know that you are with us at all times and all places, and we pray today that you will fill us with energy and wisdom, and, and as we resume this journey through the book of Samuel, and we pray that you will guide us to a deeper understanding of the truth about who you are and who we are. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we have two chapters left, chapters 30 and 31, and um, chapter 31 is relatively brief, but chapter 30 tells a long and very interesting story. So let me just bring us up to date, okay? The Philistines and the Israelites. The Israelites are under the leadership of Saul. He's the king. They have all gathered up at the Jezreel Valley, up in, up in the north. Um, not as far north as they could be because it's south of Galilee, but it's north of, of this area where most things have been taking place. So they're going to meet up there. And David goes with the Philistines because you remember that David has been with the Philistines um, and has convinced King Achish that he has gone over to the other side. And so he goes with them with his band of 600 fighters and they're going to join in and supposedly fight David's own kinsmen. And though Achish trusts David, Achish is the other Philistine kings do not. And so the long and short of it is that David is sent home. They tell David and his 600 followers, basically, not quite in these words, we don't trust you enough to have you fight alongside us. So go back to Ziklag. Remember, we, don't, we aren't really sure where Ziklag is. You can just kind of pick a spot right down in here and go back to Ziklag and... Um, while we do this fighting against the, the Israelites. So David does not have to take up sword against his, against his own people. All right? We cool? Okay. So let's pick right up there. Chapter 30, verse 1. So David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day after turning back. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. The Amalekites are a traditional enemy. They're, they sort of live down here past the bottom of the screen and the bottom of the map. They are traditional enemies of, of the Jews. They attack Moses. 
and the Israelites, when they are leaving, when they are leaving Egypt, and now they've ventured northward in the absence of what? Fighting men. All the Philistines, all the Philistine fighters are headed up. David's headed up. They're all headed up. So there's a vacuum. So the Amalekites have come north to raid and plunder. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it. And they had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. What do you think it will be the fate of those women and children? Slaves. Slaves. Um, in the world at this time, really all economies were slave economies. And a way to acquire slaves was in conquest during war. And we could talk about how it worked for the Israelites. God would tell them that you are not to take any plunder at all. There was a, a, a ban on any plunder, including people, because there would be no, no, no profit in war. And if there's, I always think, if there's no profit in war, there's no reason to conduct it. But here, for the Amalekites, they're taking back slaves. They, they can either keep or they can sell, right? So when David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. You know, the writer of this book just brings out these poignant moments. So they've arrived back in Ziklag. They find the village empty, their homes burned, the women, the children, gone. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the hero of chapter 25, Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel, gone. Taken by these hated Amalekites. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. So what would make the men turn on David? They lost everything. They followed David north. They didn't even get to participate in the fight. It was a waste of time. And now they come back and they see what's happened because they were away. There was nobody there to defend the women and the children or protect the village. And, and it's, I, I get that, right? So there's like a budding mutiny against David because these men have done as he um, ordered them to do. And it's led to this, this terrible, terrible event. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and his daughters. But David found strength in Yahweh his God. This is, what, you know, we, when you go through David's story, he is a man who makes a lot of mistakes. And he does some things in the course of his life that you really just can't believe he does. We're not to them yet, but we'll get there. But what separates David from so many others is that he always comes back to God to repent, to express his sorrow, um, uh, to find strength. David comes seeking after God, which I, I think is... is is really there's a deep truth there. The Christian life is not about getting everything right. It's not about constructing a set of rules and regulations and laws that you need to make sure you keep if you're going to really you know, get where you want to be and stuff. It is about turning to God and recognizing our dependence upon God and so often throwing ourselves upon God and finding our strength in God and living in that sort of intense, continuous relationship with God. And that's what David does. 
He's the writer of the Psalms. The Psalms that he writes express a full range of human emotions. Okay? But he comes to God when he is looking for, for strength. And it's, it's, there's a lot of truth there about the kind of relationship that God wishes we all had with God. Okay? Not, not denying that David will do terrible things. We may, in the course of our lives, never do as terrible things as David will yet do. But we do things we sure regret having done. I think I've lived long enough to know that's true of everybody. But that's not the point. Not really. Okay? Well, so David says to Abiathar, who is this priest. Remember, David had... There were the priests that were all gathered at Nob, and they Saul saw them as helping David, and so he ordered the, the killing of the priests at Nob, but one of the priests escaped, Abiathar, the, the son of Ahimelech. And so he's been with David now, this, this priest of Israel. And David said to Abiathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. This is that uh, 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 stone garment um, that would they would use to in a way communicate with God it's probably a way that it was used kind of like the throwing of lots which is what the um, disciples do after Jesus returns to the father they simply draw lots throw lots throw dice draw short straws whatever to ascertain who <coughs> who should rep I know I'm too old for that. Who should replace Judas? Because there need to be 12, 12 apostles. So they draw lots, and the one chosen is Matthias. And they do that method because they understand that God will determine how those lots come out. David asks for the ephod. He conducts some sort of thing that we're not really sure exactly what he does, but it is, it is his way to inquire of God. And so the, the questions are often yes or no questions, right? The answer might be a little longer in the text, but they're basically yes or no questions. So, David says to Abiathar, bring me the, a, the, a, the ephod. And Abiathar brought it to him, and David inquired of Yahweh, shall I pursue this raiding party? Part A. Will I overtake them? Part B. But you see, both are yes or no questions, right? Pursue them, Yahweh answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. So David uses the ephod. He communicates with God. God fills him with confidence. And God says, go after them, pursue them. You will catch them. And David, why does David want to pursue them? He's got all the, they have all the women and the children and the livestock and everything else, anything of value they could get out of the villages, you know they took. So, verse 9. David and his 600 men with him came to the Besor Valley where some stayed behind. Okay? So, um, This is David and his men coming south. I should have put that map a second ago, but this map is showing where the Besor River is. It's sort of right here. So this is the area of Ziklag. So they're going to head this direction, trying to run down the Amalekites. Right? And of course, they're literally what? Running. <laughs> they're literally running. These people are on foot. So David and the 600, these are his 600 fighters, came with him to the Besor Valley where, where some stayed behind. Listen to this. This is important. 200 of them were too exhausted to cross the valley, but David and the other 400 continued the pursuit. So they go, and now we know that they are going fast, fast, fast because they want to catch them. They're trying to go faster then the Amalekites are running away. And a third of the men, 200 of the 600, are exhausted. And they just, they just can't go on. 
And so they stay, and then the other 400 continue to run down, run down the valley. I just had a flash in my mind to the movie The Lord of the Rings. One of the rings when they're just running, 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 trying to catch, just running, 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 trying to catch up to, well, in The Lord of the Rings, the bad guys, but same thing here. So, any thoughts or questions before we go on? They're running in hot pursuit. Hot pursuit of the Amalekites. So they, verse 11, they found an Egyptian in a field and brought him to David. So they gave the Egyptian water to drink. They gave him food to eat, part of a cake of pressed figs and two cakes of raisins. Isn't it fascinating how the details are preserved of this encounter with this man? He ate and he was revived. For he had not eaten any food or drunk any water for three days and three nights. So you know the man's in tough shape. He's in bad shape. And David asked him, well, who do you belong to? Where do you come from? And he said, I am an Egyptian, the slave of an Amalekite. He might have been taken into slavery like is planned for the women and children of David and his men. He says, we raided, the my master abandoned me when I became ill three days ago. Right? Yeah, he's going to slow him down. Malachites don't want to be slowed down, so, you know, the weak or the infirm or those who get injured, they're just left behind. Left behind to what? Die. Die. Verse 14, the Egyptian says, we raided the Negev of the Carathites, some territory belonging to Judah, and the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag. So David asked him, can you lead me down to this raiding party? Because he wants a guide, a scout, right? One who's gonna, one who's gonna lead them to where the Amalekites actually are. Well, obviously, we're, we're also moving fast. It's been, it's been days now, they were moving fast, so fast they left at least this one Egyptian, maybe others behind. And the Egyptians answered, Swear to me before God that you will not kill me or hand me over to my master, and I will take you down to them. So the Egyptian wants sanctuary. He wants to be protected, and he does not want to be turned over to the Amalekites. So David would, of course, say yes to that, right? Verse 16, he led David down, and there they were, the Amalekites, scattered over the countryside, eating, drinking, reveling. It's party time. They think they've gotten far enough away they have nothing to worry about. And they're just all down there having a big old time. I hate to imagine some of the things they might be doing They've just got all these slaves and stuff. Ah. Eating, drinking, reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. I got all this food to eat. Most of it's not going to keep. So they eat it. They're going to have found wine and other things to drink, so they drink it. So, basically, David's going to fall on them. David and his men. David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day. So that's 24 hours, right? Do I have that right? Yes. David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day, and none of them got away except for 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. So they had some camels, and they moved fast, and these 400 young guys of the Amalekites, they took off. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. He took all the flocks and the herds, and his men drove them ahead of the other livestock, saying, this is David's plunder. So they got, they recovered their wives, and they recovered their children, 
and they recovered livestock. In fact, they recovered more livestock than the Amalekites took, because remember, the Amalekites also raided other places, including some Philistine places. And so they're going back, and this extra livestock, the men say, well, this is David's plunder, being, being the commander. And so they're going to make their way back to Ziklag. And, and you can just imagine the scene when these men are reunited with their wives and their children. And, you know, in my class yesterday, I talked some about how children were seen in the ancient world. And they, they were generally seen as sort of being non-persons. They didn't, ha half of newborns didn't make it past the age of five. Um, they were more mouths to feed in a, uh, cultures that didn't have enough food to begin with. And you even, you see in the Roman culture, in Jesus' day, the way that women were seen as, you know, something less than fully human. But when you look at the individual treatment of wives, or daughters, and the things written on their tombstones, or other, you know, um, artifacts that we have found, of course, it isn't really like that. They love their children, they love their wives, um, and they're glad to have them back. And they do have them back. And now Ahi Ahinoam and Abigail uh, David's wives are back with David, and they have been saved from just a terrible, terrible existence. Terrible. All right? Any thoughts, reflections, questions? Well, looking at this uh, The Malachites would have been long gone by the time David and his men finished fighting up in the north. So the fact that they came back is, is probably God's hand bringing them back, right? There are a lot of different ways to, to, see, to, um, to see these things. Well, David came back to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow him and who were left behind at the Besor Valley. They came out to meet David and the other 400 men who are with David and all of the women and children, that whole thing. As David and his men approached, he asked them how they were. These are the 200. But all the evil men and the troublemakers among David's followers, and you know, remember David's followers are a tough group. <laughs> they are, they have been outcasts from Israelite society and on the run with David, hiding out now for a long time. And I imagine there are some, I'm sure there were some nastier dudes in there. And they say, because these men, these 200, did not go out with us, we will not share with them the plunder we recovered. However, each of the 200 may take his wife and children and go. So the, these folks say, okay, they're not going to be able to, to share in what we got from the Amalekites because they just stayed back here and we went and we did the fighting. And <sighs> So here's David's reply. No, my brothers, you must not do that with what Yahweh has given us. He has protected us and delivered into our hands the raiding party that came against us. Who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same as that of him who went down to the battle. All will share alike. David made this a statute and an ordinance for Israel from that day to this. And of course, militarily, it's as important to look after your supplies and all the rest of it and your rear as it is to be on the front line. A very small percentage of the U.S. Army is ever on the front line. Most of it's all in supporting the people on the front line. 
But David, um, in this, wants there to be a just outcome. And it will be that way in Israel from that time forward. So this is one of those stories. It, it, there, there's a fancier word for it, but it's an origin story. Because as time goes on, people would ask, well, how was it decided that those who guarded the supplies that gave the same share as those who were doing the fighting? That story answers the question, right? It's a story of origins. Fancy word is etiology, E-T-I. Kind of like disease, you want to, and etiology of a disease is finding out where it began. Okay, so now they're coming back. When David reached the Glag, he sent some of the plunders, plunder to the elders of Judah, who were his friends, saying, here is a gift for you from the plunder of Yahweh's enemies. Well, isn't that interesting? After all this time with the Philistines, I don't know if you take it on the surface, David still has connections with some of the elders in the tribe of Judah. Smart move. Smart move. And he sends back some of the wealth, the plunder that he has taken. Right? And David sent it to those who were in Bethel, Ramoth Negev, Jatir, Arer, Sifmoth, Eshtemoa, Rachel, to those in the towns of, of the Jeremelites and the Kenites, to those in Horma, Bor Ashan, Athek, and this one I can do with certainly, Hebron. <laughs> <laughs> we have a high school named Hebron down the road. Okay? Um, and to those in all the other places where he and his men had roamed. So this is what? When he sends this stuff to these places, that they took from the Amalekites, what is it? Payback, Pay peace offering, goodwill offering. Here, here, yes, I'm st I've been with you all this time, and I'm giving you all this stuff. Yes, I'm still one of your guys. I'm still a kinsman. I'm an Israelite. I'm sending you all of this, and it came from those Amalekites, right? So, yeah, and so some of it, secondhand, came from the Philistines. So, okay. So you've got to figure David <coughs> is in better standing. All right? So, thus ends chapter 30. So questions, comments, reflections? What the writer's doing is, is, is just tracing the stories of David and Saul and all these events with these these. And, yeah. The one thing we don't know is David hadn't been sent back to where he took off. The town that was burned. But we don't know if he would have attacked his own people, do we? There's no way of knowing. Okay, so Don is raising this question. If David had not been sent back, would he have actually fought on the side of the Philistines against the Israelites. But you could see in God's providence, which is a way to talk about God's care and, product and protection, he doesn't have to. And I would see the hand of God in the Philistine decision to send him back. You know, I, I hadn't made this connection before. Do you remember when David is going to go after Nabal? And he straps on his sword, he's really angry at being slighted, and Abigail stops him. And she stops him from doing the wrong thing, from, getting, from, from letting his bloodlust run and, and killing Nabal and, that, and all of his men and the rest of it. In a way, the same thing happens here, right? I think God... Re says David in the sense of the Philistines rejecting him and sending him back. So, so David, 
it worked out for David on two levels. One, he did get the sanctuary he actually needed from Achish because Saul was relentless and would have probably found him. He gets that, and he doesn't have to fight the Israelites because he's rejected by the other king. So then he goes back. So, yeah. Huh. See, there's a lot of, a lot of levels to all these things. Yes. That was a that was one year and four months. One year and four months. Right. So what we know, even though there aren't really enough time tags to really figure everything out, he is on the run for something that you would measure in years. Right? So he's gone from probably a pretty young guy to a not so young guy in this long period when he's running from from Saul, if he spends a year and four months just with the Philistines, there was all the running around before that, right? Yeah. So it, it's not a it's not a short period period of time. Yes, Pat. No. Anything else, uh, Patty? Well, online, Linda Waldo made a comment comparing where he wants to pay the. Man yes. To That's a good connection. So Linda Waldo brings up the parable of the of the workers. The guy, remember this? Jesus tells the parable about workers who go to work at 8 a.m. and those who go to work at 12 p.m. and those who go to work at 4 o'clock when there's only an hour left to work, but the the owner pays them all the same. He paid them all what they promised, and the ones who would start at 8 a.m. are upset, you know, and Jesus says, point is that, well, the, the landowner gave everybody what he promised. And, you know, if there is grace in some of this, that's only a good thing. It's not unjust. God, the landowner keeps his promises to the 8 a.m. people, the 12 p.m. people, and he just pours a lot of grace out on the 4 p.m. people who show up to work in the parable. So I, I've always taught that as a parable of grace. This is a measure of grace from David to the 200. Um, and also, I th just think it, it's a good precedent um, to, to, <laughs> to pay those who are guarding the supplies and watching the supplies and as in the same way that you pay those combat. But you might, I guess in our army, we have a combat, combat pay. But everybody gets paid. The moment when, when Jesus is on the cross, he's pouring grace out on the one rebel next to him. He's pouring it out on the people who have crucified him when he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You know, those are all the, there's all these little pieces, Old Testament and New, that have led me to have a very expansive view of God's grace. You know, we want to chop it down and make it, make it this, this, because there's a lot of scandal associated with grace. We want everybody to get what they deserve. But that's not God's way. God's way is not to make sure everybody gets what they deserve, good or, good or ill. It's not about that. It, it is about God's grace, God's mercy. Yes, God's justice, but tempered by mercy. Tempered by mercy. Anything else? All right, so let's go on to chapter 31. Because who haven't we been talking about since he went to see the witch at Endor? Oh. Oh. So that's going to bring us back up to the Jezreel Valley. And I put the name Mount Gilboa on there because that's where this next chapter is going to be focused, is on Mount Gilboa. It is really not a, like a single hill, it's like a little ridge. Wait, wait, here we go. It's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I don't have to. Okay, so it is this little, little ridge line right there that's known as Mount Gilboa. Right, right there where the Jezreel Creek meets the Jordan River. Right, right in there. That's where all this is going to take place. And here's a picture of those hills slash mountains today in Israel. Um, <clears throat> nope. Actually, it could be an Appalachian in a way, couldn't it? <laughs> I mean, really. I mean, it's just, uh, yeah, they're, they're tree-covered hills and mountains. It's, yeah, that's what it is. None of them, don't, they don't look like the Rockies. Okay. The highest place in that immediate part of the world is on the other side of the Jordan River. Mount Hermon is like 9,000 feet. But these are, these are not so much. But if it's all you have, they're impressive. So there we go. That's, that's the scene of the action, right? So Mount Gilboa, these, these few <coughs> little mountains, large hills along the south side in the Jordan, Jezreel Valley where it meets the Jordan River. And, <clears throat> okay, all right, and chapter 31, now the Philistines fought against Israel, the Israelites fled before them, and many fell dead on Mount Gilboa, there's a lot in that, isn't there, there's no lead up, there's no nothing, there's one sentence in the English. The Philistines and the Israelites have met at Mount Gilboa and the Israelites have gotten their butts kicked. The Philistines were in hot pursuit of Saul and his sons. They have won the day. They have won the day, and they killed Saul's sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua. The fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and run me through. Or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. So Saul does not want to be captured live. He doesn't even want his body to be taken by the Philistines. The Philistines are the uncircumcised. Remember, for the Jews, there are, if you take all the people that they know, there are two categories, Gentiles and Jews, Gentiles and Israelites. The, the uncircumcised and the circumcised. And um, he wants his armor bearer, which would be a person very close, like a valet, very close to Saul, to run his sword through him and to kill Saul so that Saul's body can be taken away by the Israelites and not left to the Philistines. Or even worse, for Saul to be captured by the Philistines. Did you have a question? No? No, okay. All right. I, saw, I thought I saw this. <laughs> oh, uh. That's a big ask. Saul is whom? Who is Saul? He's the king. And he's asked this little guy, this armor bearer, this nobody really, to take Saul's sword and run him through with it to kill the king. Regicide, it's called, right? Killing the king is regicide. And even if the king asks you, I mean, plus they all really know what? What do they all know about Saul? He's kind of half mad. Yeah. He's kind of half mad. They, they've seen his, these times when his darkness has overtaken him. So, but the armor bearer was terrified and would not do it. So 
So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. So Saul commits suicide. You know, and, and at this moment, I, I can't help but my mind going back to when Saul first came on the scene. And he was like the king from Central Casting. Remember? He was like Gaston. He was tall and good looking and handsome and strong. He was the epitome, everybody thought, of what a king should be. Because we tend to look at appearances. Undeniable. But God doesn't. God looks at the heart. And Saul, Saul was a bad choice. And see, here's the thing about Saul. About Saul. Saul was a bad choice for something that God didn't even want to do. Did God want the Israelites to have a human king? No, God was to be their king. God tells Samuel, go tell them everything that's wrong with kings. For Samuel 8, tell them everything that's wrong with kings. They will take, 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 take. That's a verb you need to put away up here. That's what king, because it's coming up again. They take, 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 take. Is there a Taylor Swift song? <laughs> shake, 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 shake. I know I was close. It rhymes, by golly. Yes. This is what happens inside my head when I'm teaching. It's, you, sh you should try living there with me. Okay. So take, 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 take. They'll take your women. They'll take your money. They'll take your barns. They'll take your kids. They'll take your sons. They'll send them off to war. They'll take everything. That's what kings do. They take, take, take. But the people insist upon it anyway. So the whole idea of a human king was very ambiguous, and it's almost like God has to be dragged into it. And then God tells Samuel to anoint Saul, who proves to be a disappointment because he is because a, a couple of times he does what he thinks is best rather than hewing exactly to the line that Samuel has given him. Now let me ask you, do you, th do you really think that God could find the perfect king for Israel? Wouldn't all the choices God makes, God could make be in a way, a bad choice? Aren't we all marked by frailty? What? Can you say human? Can you say human? human kings, yeah, because God's supposed to be their king. Yeah. But when it comes to getting human kings, they're all going to be, right? They all <laughs> go on and read the book of Kings. They all are, almost all. There's, there, there's some that are, are, you know, a cut above the rest. But... We're all frail. We all sin. We all have darkness in our hearts. We all make mistakes. We all disappoint God. We will all do things that we know God would rather we didn't, but we know better. Paul says what, famously? I do the things I shouldn't do, and I don't do the things I should do. That is, that's humanity. Um, so this whole kingship thing is filled with ambiguity and you come to Saul now and he has committed suicide he simply is he knows they've lost they have lost badly right just in these few verses the portrait is painted of not just a little well we better we better retreat you know they have lost badly, and the Philistines are overrunning the Israelites, and they're running down Saul and his sons, and Jonathan is dead at the hands of the Philistines. And Saul does not want to fall into their hands alive or dead. It's quite an ending for Saul. I don't know when we go back to chapters 14, 15, and 16. 16 is where... Uh, Samuel anoints David. I, who could see this coming? And it has been, to the question asked earlier, 
a long time that Saul has been on the throne with this ever aware presence of David, that David is really God's anointed. It hasn't been a short period of time. David lived with the Philistines for 16 months, and that's only one tiny bit of the story. So how much, how much more time is there in this? And now Saul falls on his own sword. The way is clear for David, the way is clear for David right? We're going to, well, when you come back, after we've been to, Patty and I have been away, we're going to see that that way is not quite as clear as we might think it is, right? Because how many tribes are there of Israelites? Twelve tribes of Israelites. They've all got, <laughs> they've all got chieftains. They've, it's, it, it's like trying to cook a pot of soup with twelve cooks, you know? Yeah, 12 guys all standing around the barbecue grill trying to get those, uh, yeah, it's not going to work too well. So, verse 7, when the Israelites along the valley and those across the Jordan saw that the Israelite army had fled and that Saul and his sons had died, they abandoned their towns and fled and the Philistines came and occupied them. This is a total rout, total rout. And the, and the Philistines are capturing towns, the stuff that's in them, occupying them. The Philistines are fleeing. The next day, when the Philistines came to strip the dead, strip the dead of what? Armor. And armor, anything of value, armor, weapons, anything that would be um, uh, constructed, sandals, anything that they could find. You know, this is a world that they, I mean, they don't have much capacity to make things, to manufacture things. So they're coming to strip the dead. They found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. How would they know that it's Saul and his sons? The armor, the, armor, the clothing they're wearing, the colors they're wearing, the protection accorded them. I don't think they have to know what they look like, though that's even, even that's possible because these Philistines and, and Israelites have lived in close connection with each, other, with each other for such a long time. But you wouldn't have to know the faces to know who the royalty were on that battlefield. So they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. They cut off Saul's head and they stripped off his armor, and they sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim the news in the temple of their idols and among their people. This is a resounding defeat of the Israelites. They didn't just win the battle and chase off the Israelite army. They now have the head of King Saul, the king who brought together the 12 tribes, the first king, there are three kings of the united Israel, Saul, David, Solomon. So Saul is the first king of the united Israel, acknowledged as king by all 12 tribes. They put his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreths. The Ashtoreths are pagan gods. And fastened his body to the wall of bet Chan or bet Shean, as it would later be called. So they put his armor in the temple of, this pagan, of the pagan gods and they fastened his body to the wall of Bet Shean. Bet Shean, I think it's on here. It's right there where the Jezreel Valley meets the Jordan River. So why would they, why would they go to the trouble of nailing his body to the wall of the city? What? A trophy? Everybody knows. everybody knows. Yeah, it's a trophy. It tells everybody, look what the Philistines did. Look what's going to befall you if you try to stand up to the strength of the Philistines. It is, it is, 
the connection here biblically is to the cross jesus the romans crucified people they put them up on these crosses um, which weren't nearly as high off the ground as are typically depicted in movies they weren't that far off the ground because you had to get the the crucified person up there but they did it so that everybody could see this is what happens to those who oppose the power of rome it's why crucifixion wasn't used for getting rid of ordinary criminals whatever they really felt that was necessary that's not what it was about it was about crucifying in this humiliating fashion anyone perceived as standing up to the power of rome and jesus being the messiah riding into jerusalem with every messianic symbol there is wrapped around himself he makes a public proclamation on that Sunday, on Palm Sunday, that he is the Messiah. That's what the cult and the palms and all the rest of it are coming into the East Gate. That's what it's all about. And so he goes to that cross, the same to, to suffer the death that other Galileans had suffered when he was a boy. Because Josephus tells us that there were a couple of thousand Jews crucified in about 6 AD by the Romans in order to put down a tax revolt. And they were crucified along the roadways in Galilee. Because why? Because the statement was, don't do this. Rome is in charge. Do no, we do not tolerate revolt, rebellion of any kind. So Jesus, King of the Jews, you're going you're gonna to end up on a cross. And here's Saul with really the same idea. I've, I've described um, before. There is a city, maybe it's Guanajuato down in Mexico. Maybe somebody's been there. This, the, uh, there's, a, there's the old walled fortress. And coming out of the four corners of that fortress, there's a long bar and like a bird cage hanging on the end of it. Well, what that was used for is they would put Saul or whoever was the enemy, you know, the king, the conquered king or whatever, in that, in that cage. And they would be left there for however long. I guess maybe until they needed the cage again. But it's, it's what it's, you know. We're blessed to live in a world that has, for all that we could conjure up is wrong with our world, and there's much. We are blessed to live in a world that has 2,000 years of a Christian ethic behind us. Okay, so. They put his armor in the temple of the Ashtoreths, fastened Saul's body to the wall of Bethshan. When the people of Jabesh Gilead little to the south, heard what the Philistines had done to Saul. All their valiant men marched through the night to Beth. They took down the bodies of Saul and his sons from the wall of Beth and went to Jabeth, where they burned them so that their bodies would not be desecrated again. So that during the night, they go to Beth Shan and they remove Saul's body from the wall, the bodies of his sons. They take them back and they quickly burn them so that there can be no more desecration. Then they took their bones and they buried them under a tamarisk tree at Jabesh and they fasted seven days. So that's a fast of mourning, of grieving. Now, this tamarisk tree um, is, I think, noted because I think it's only in the Old Testament, maybe in the Bible, like three times. But it's, it's a large flowering tree that provides a lot of shade. And a land, I'm telling you, that's not as much shade as you would, as you would like there. And Saul is now dead. And so the question is, what is going to happen now? Now, when we come back in a few weeks, four weeks, whatever, um, 
the question is going to be what happens next? What does David do? What do the tribal chieftains do? And I will, if you want to, just a little word about what's coming. It is still a while before David becomes the king of a united Israel. It is because David may, be, may have been anointed by Samuel, but that doesn't mean all of his fellow Israelites right, are ready to embrace him as anything. How long did he live with the Philistines? 16 months. What did the Philistines just do? They routed the Israelite army, occupied Israelite towns, killed Saul, killed his son Jonathan and the other two sons. So just don't think that when you come back on August 1st, it's a nice smooth little sailing for David to now get installed, kind of like the transition, who would it be like? The transition from Elizabeth to Charles. Not, not going to be like that. Not going to be like that. So, all right. Samuel, first Samuel. In the book, as they say. Give us a round of applause. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> so, you know, we've got a little bit of time. Any thoughts, questions, reflections? And Solomon. David was 30 years. Probably more like 40. Okay, 40. Yeah. But then do we know when he was born? No, but, but. Question, how old was he when he took over? No. Let's talk about what happens in this period. Before this period that we're in, Saul, David, Solomon, we do not have a lot of clues that we would like to have about the time frames involved. But now we're going to be getting them, not just in the Bible, which doesn't, but because of outside sources about things that are happening in Israel. Outside, we're going to meet, there are, there are outside kings which show up in this story and the rest of Samuel and then the book First Kings. So we know that we are in the 11th century B.C. And we know that David reigns along, is going to, is going to reign a long time. The question reign is what? So we'll come back to that. Um, and, and Solomon will reign a long time. But they are the only, the key is to recognize that we're about, we're about a thousand years before Jesus, about a thousand years before Jesus, a um, little bit more than that, just a little bit more than that. And there are only, th there will be only three kings of the united Israel, Saul, David, Solomon, and then there will be civil war. Okay, and that story is told in the book of Kings. Okay. Other things. Yes, sir. Chapter 30, verses 24 and 25. To me, is, is there a, a hidden message there about the, in the military, we call it the war in the war, that he has to make a proclamation and say, you know, I've had this issue in the past. Well, I, okay, so that's a really good point because if you have any military experience, you know that, well, the supplies need to be guarded, the rear needs to be guarded, that there's a whole lot of support that goes into supporting the people who are, act, the men and women who are actually in combat. So, sure. And so I don't think it's a secret. Perhaps it betray, perhaps it shows us David's wisdom, you know, as a leader, to see that the 200 men who had to stay behind because they were exhausted but were there to guard the supplies is going to share in the plunder alongside the men who actually do the fighting. And that can be true, and it can be true. It's a measure of God's grace, David's grace toward these men. And I think we should take from it that in the ancient world, that's kind of an unusual practice. That's what uh, another piece of what I would take because it's singled out. That this, this really isn't how everybody did it, but I, I don't know the facts behind that. What else? Yes, sir. So the big question in my mind, it changes subject. Did you know that um, Robert's church in Magnolia looked like the one in the <laughs> church in now? 
I did not know that Robert's Church of Magnolia looked like what we have now. I didn't, did anybody know? <laughs> I don't know that, but Robert did. Now, let me tell you how, why the church looks like it does. It does it because there was a building. Remember, Robert didn't even get to name the church what he wanted, yeah. right? Yeah. He wanted to name the church the Good Shepherd, but he, he lay people at St. Andrew are kind of like cats. They're very accomplished, high-achieving cats. And so Robert knew that part of his job was trying to herd those cats. So actually, the, as the story that I know is that the building committee at the time, led by John Hamilton, chose this style that we have, the red brick and there, all that stuff, because of SMU. If you go down to SMU, you find the same style architecture also used at Robert's Church of Magnolia. So knowing Robert as I do, I think Robert was quite happy with where that conversation progressed and didn't feel like he needed to bring in too much of his own stuff. But I don't know because I wasn't there. It was, this happened all a long time ago. But it was, I have been told it was, it's a, I think, Georgian style architecture, which is what you have down at SMU and now we have here. And it, it does look, St. Andrew looks like a church, right? Not a warehouse. Not a, it looks like a church, not a warehouse. Okay, Charlotte has a public service announcement about Sunday afternoon. Okay, so I'll make it because I have the mic. It's because everybody can hear me, including the online people. That Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock, there's going to be a Stars and Stripes uh, uh, concert in the sanctuary this Sunday, 2 o'clock. So you, so you might, it's going to be, it's going to be excellent, right? And it's going to be free. Okay, free, free, free. F-R-E-E, -E, free. The, pri the price is going to be zero at 2 o'clock. So Patty and I, we're going to have church. I'm preaching this Sunday. We're going to, I'm going to preach it. We're going to have class. Then we're going to go get lunch somewhere. We're going to come back for the 2 o'clock, you know, concert in the sanctuary. It'll be a real, it's a real, it'll be a real anchor for the 4th of July, because it's always, it's always great, as well as cheap. <laughs> cheap. <laughs> cheap is a special treat, but it's going to be excellent. Anything else? Yes, sir. So Andy's asking me if the expression fell on the sword comes from here. I don't know this for a fact, but I would not be surprised because I have used references in the past that illustrate the hundreds, nay, thousands of expressions that we have in English that come from two sources and two sources only, the Bible and Shakespeare. There's, an edit, there, there's a little um, kind of, not really, I guess it's an op-ed in today's Wall Street Journal um, connecting um, the S Shakespeare's play, The Tempest, with the submersible that was lost. But it brought out several places where, um, like, to call something a sea change, a sea change is a big change in circumstances where everything comes from Shakespeare's play, The Tempest. So between Shakespeare and the Bible, you would learn all kinds of English expressions. And whenever I look at lists like that of those, I'm always shocked. And it's why children used to be educated in English using Shakespeare and using the Bible. So maybe, maybe, Andy. Yes. They were at Jabesh Gilead. It was a group of Israelites. This was a town that obviously the Philistines had not occupied, but they're pretty close. So they s sneak out at night and they go and they recover these bodies and they bring them back to Jabesh Gilead and then burn them. So that, that is. So it was the right thing to do for your people. It was the right thing to do. It was 
they didn't want Saul and his sons to be desecrated in this way. Just imagine that you had a loved one. I know you could say, well, it's just his body, but just think if it was a loved one of yours. Would you want that? No, of course not. I would not. So, yeah. So, but it is a band of Israelites from Jabesh Gilead um, that go up to Beth Shan and retrieve these bodies. Gary? Yay. For those online, we are um, applauding that the Strength for Service Devotional Project has been completed and they're going to be distributed over the weekend to the Plano Police Department and Fire Department. Okay. Well, anything else? Yes, sir. Well, the question was, did the expression we use, which we use in a lot of non-military settings, to fall on one sword, did it come from, is, is this the origination of that saying in English? And that's why I was talking about, well, it might well be because we have so many that come from the Bible and come from Shakespeare. So Saul, Saul does, he does get a give up. I mean, he doesn't want to be captured and he doesn't want his body to be desecrated. And, of course, he fails in that, right? It is desecrated, so. Anything else? Charlotte. Did Saul say all three of his sons were killed at the same time? Were they all in battle? Don't they usually leave somebody behind? They were all in, they were all in battle. They were, they, they, the question was, is it surprising that Saul's sons were fighting alongside him? I don't think so. They... Well, all three of them. He may have had other ones stashed away somewhere. Probably did have other ones since they had multiple wives. Probably had other ones who were too young to be there that day. Um, uh, Jonathan has a son himself whom you meet in the book of Kings. This, this, and maybe Second Samuel even, Mephibosheth. So, so we, we are not done with the story of Saul's family, Jonathan's family, the working out of this. We're not done with Saul's daughter, Michael. Remember her? We're not done with her. There's a whole, all of this stuff that we've been doing is going to bring us, wow, right on through into 2 Samuel and all the threads and and all that stuff will be there. Remember I told you to remember Abner, and I told you to remember all that stuff. It's going to become more and more prominent as we move through the book Second Samuel. Okay? Yeah. So th that's why it's one, it's one scroll. It's just one scroll. All right. Anything else? Well, let's pray, and I just, you know, we'll gather back here in Pirro Hall on August 1st. So let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to have had the opportunity to be here. Um, there are prayers that we carry on our hearts all the time. People who <coughs> need healing and comfort, and we are strengthened knowing that your spirit lifts those prayers up to you. We're going to be taking a long break here, but when we come just bring us all back here um, with enthusiasm and healthy and strong because um, we value this time together, time to study your word, time to enjoy one another, um, just time to be, to be your people. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. So adios, everybody. Amen.